Hi, this is Steve at Blessed Hope Forever. We're studying together in 2 Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were uh, at the last verse of the sixth chapter. We were, were just beginning the seventh. Uh, we've been looking at our responsibilities in the ministry of reconciliation. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we praise you again for the privilege and the opportunity of studying your word together. We recognize that we are on hallowed ground, that we are there because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit take the hour and strip away that which is foolish, that which has not been carefully thought out. Direct our thinking in the study of your word that we together might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. We were told that this was God's purpose and God's program, that that's what he was doing in Christ, uh, and that, that transcends all other concepts of history. Even before God spoke the worlds into existence, he purposed the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the reconciliation of the world system, not imputing men's trespasses unto them, uh, the central point of God's program uh, contains the ministry that's been delivered unto us. That's how unique this is. This ministry of reconciliation, I've suggested to you, and I repeat it over and over again, I hope you don't get tired of hearing it. What you, what you hear from me is not truth. What this book says is truth. And I trust that the Holy Spirit only uses me to, to stir your thinking, uh, that it directs your thinking into the truth of the Word of God. I suggested uh, to you uh, folks that that ministry is a ministry that is settled in a finished work, that we are not proclaiming a continuing activity of God, but that we have been delivered a ministry which declares the finished work of Jesus Christ. What Christ did, not something that man must do. In the sixth chapter, we were told not to take this lightly, not to take it casually. After all, if that's God's central theme and God's central program, surely we shouldn't take it casually. We uh, looked at our responsibilities both uh, toward God, uh, toward uh, the Word of God, and toward other believers as ministers of the gospel of reconciliation. Uh, beginning at the 11th verse, we were told in this ministry that we are not to couple our yoke, uh, which is the yoke of Jesus Christ, to the yoke of a non-believer. And I suggested to you that the, the inference, I believe, is, is there is clear that the unbeliever has a yoke, and surely the scriptures are clear that you and I have a yoke, and, and we are commanded not to couple that yoke with an unbeliever. I further suggested to you that we were still in the context of the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, whether that yoke is marriage, uh, business, uh, buying a an automobile, or whatever it is in your own personal conviction, let's all at least be fair that the text is centered in the ministry of reconciliation. It may be in your mind perfectly all right to start a business uh, in cooperation with a partner who is not a believer, uh, but it surely could not be all right in your minds to start an activity to evangelize the masses yoked together with an unbeliever. The, the central concept is still the ministry of reconciliation. The reason we, we should not be so yoked, I believe, is twofold. Uh, one, looking back, we were told that darkened hearts couldn't hear, so we now have an un, a clean and an unclean yoke. And secondly, we were told that enlightened hearts will hear no matter how poorly that the presentation may be. Uh, looking forward, we have a group, a collection of God's statements from the Old Testament, and I don't believe that this is some poetic license on the part of Paul. 
I'm, uh, I'm going to suggest that in the next few verses, a tremendous amount of importance is, has to be placed on your, uh, uh, your perspective. Are we looking at Paul's thoughts, Paul's mind, Paul's genius, Paul's commitment, Paul's, Paul's yieldness, Paul's obedience, or, or are we looking at the Word of God? And I do not believe that we're looking at some liberty that Paul took in gathering a collection of Old Testament statements, uh, some of which are, are poorly quoted, uh, some which do not seem to be properly quoted. They're not quoted the same, word for word. Uh, all of those problems evaporate, though, if we suddenly realize that we're looking at what the Holy Spirit is saying, not Paul. You know, what I said in the Old Testament is, is God says, is what I meant. It was God who chose Israel, not Israel who chose God. It was God who categorically declared that they were His people, and, uh, and they were his, uh, he was their God. Now we find that because God has separated them and the, the grammar is, is perfectly consistent because God separated them from the other nations. They didn't ask to be separated. In fact, God is very blunt with them. Uh, I didn't separate you because you're, uh, because you're big or because you're good or because you're powerful or anything else. I took you because I love you. And you might ask, well, what in the world had Israel done to be loved? And I think that's characteristic of modern Christianity. Dearly beloved, what did Noah do to find grace in the eyes of the Lord? If Noah did anything to find grace in the eyes of the Lord, he didn't find grace. He found reward. God did not shower grace on Noah God rewarded Noah for something good Noah did. So we teach our little kids in the Sunday school class, you know, that everybody was naughty but Noah. And since Noah was good, then God rewarded him with grace. That's not grace, folks. You don't understand grace. You didn't read Romans. God surely, clearly, tells us that every man's thought was only evil continually. How in the world you pull Noah out of that is beyond me because God tells me that a man whose only thought was evil continually found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There was nothing different about Noah except that he belonged to God. Israel belonged to God. Israel belongs to God. Uh, Look to the pit from which you've been digged, God says in Isaiah. Why don't, you, why, why don't you just look back to what you were and you'll understand the grace of God. You'll find out uh, that it's not because you are Jews and not because you're descendants of Abraham and not because you keep the law, which you didn't, they didn't, uh, but because of the grace of, of Almighty God that you're what you are. And I'm your God, so I've separated you. Therefore, because this is true, come out from among them and be what you are. The word there, separated, uh, is a passive, not anything that you do, but it's a passive voice in the Greek. It's not anything that you do, but something that God's already done. And the appeal is not for you to do what God has already done, but for you to live like what you already are. Dearly beloved, most Christians I know go through their lives begging, beseeching God to do something that He's already done. And all of a sudden now the language changes. If you're willing to do that, I will not only be your God and you will not only be my people, but I will be your Father. You will be my sons and daughters. You know, we have the... Uh, we have the grace of God stamped indelibly on the page. He chose them. They're His. They're His, they're his people. If they're willing to enter into fellowship, it's Father and Son. If they're not willing to enter into fellowship, it's God and people. Now I get the impression occasionally that, that somehow I minimize fellowship in this teaching, and I don't want to do that. I believe it is supremely important.
What I don't want to do is so stress the importance of fellowship that you lose sight of the certainty of grace. I think it's a terrible, terrible thing to lose fellowship with God. What a marvelous thought that the sovereign God who spoke the world into existence, who simply just cast dust into the, the air, the sky, and, and called them stars and planets, that, that that God wants to be my father. He's my God. I'm not going to change that. He wants to be my father. I think that's a staggering concept. No wonder the chapter began, don't take this casually. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. The monarch of the ages desires to be my father and offers me the opportunity of fellowship. But he declares with the certainty of his almighty power that he is in fact my God and that I am in fact his child. And the area of fellowship is an area now of human responsibility. Human responsibility. I believe it is supremely important. I refuse to believe it is necessary for entrance into heaven. No one, no one will ever convince me that the certainty of heaven depends on human works. I mean, what a, what a horrible thing to even say. If the certainty of heaven is not the finality of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know how to read. I am Perfectly willing to agree, however, the certainty of fellowship is obedience, and so the chapter apparently ends. It seems like it ends. I don't think it does. I'm certain uh, that's why those who divided the scriptures into chapters and verses ended it at verse 18. I will be a father unto you. Uh, there's a personal tone that's not there. I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 18, I will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters. It is a marvelous opportunity to be a carrier of the ministry of reconciliation. So we're now at the first verse of the seventh chapter. I suggest it's part of chapter six, but that's up to you. Since we have these promises, we really have them. The word promise there is, is the same root as our word gospel. It isn't a a nebulous promise that may or may not take place. It isn't a promise that depends upon some response from you. Having, therefore, these grand statements from God, that would, that would be a better translation in the way that we are uh, using uh, promise in common language today. Since we absolutely have these grand declarations from God, dearly beloved, Dearly Beloved. Does dearly beloved mean that Paul really loves these Corinthians? Well, I'm sure he does. <clears throat> you know, most commentaries I look at, without exception, speak of the heart of Paul here. If you have a, a Schofield reference Bible, you probably have the column divided. Now we're going to look at the heart of Paul. And, and folks, I don't want to look at Paul's heart. The, a heart that Scripture says is incurably wicked. If all you and I are doing here is studying a document that reveals what a great man Paul was, well, you know, we might, we might as well start a channel called FOP, Followers of Paul, instead of BHF. You know, like, hi, this is Steve. Welcome to FOP. You know, you know it seems to me that the dearly beloved speaks of the love of God for a disobedient people. Who did he write this to? Well, the Ephesians. You know, they were so obedient and so nice. They were, they were faithful children of God. But that isn't where it occurred. It occurs in, in Corinth, the center, the Corinth, folks, the center of filth, really. I mean, Corinth was so wicked that if somebody wanted to catalog you as a, as a really despicable person, you were called a Corinthian. In Paul's day, Corinthian was a common household word for a base person, a lustful person, where you'd almost have to hide your head in shame. You know, it's like, where do you go to church? Oh, I go to church in, I go to church in Corinth. You know, it's, you know, 
what'd you say? I didn't, I didn't quite hear you. I went, I go to church in Corinth. There isn't a better group of believers in the whole New Testament to illustrate Israel than Corinth or blessed hope forever. We're a lot like it. Dearly beloved, not Paul's love for the Corinthians. And so for the rest of the chapter, we're going to, well, what are we going to do? For the rest of the chapter, we're going to just look at Paul's love for the Corinthians? I believe Paul is being led along by the Holy Spirit to pen these words, but what we're looking at is the heart of God. Since we have these grand declarations by God, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. First of all, the word cleanse is an heiress. I don't believe this is some kind of daily washing, but rather a once for all commitment on the part of one of God's children. There's two Greek words, both of which we translate defile. They are uh, supremely different in their Greek meaning, and yet the word defile means the same thing in the English. The, the Greeks had one word for staining the material, and they, like if I put ink on the shirt, and they had another word for mud splattered on the glass that you could wash off, and this is the one for external smearing, for the mud splashed on the wind windshield. Uh, I believe that uh, intrinsic in the language is another great declaration of the grace of God that what you are, what you truly are, cannot be smeared, only the outside. Uh, James... Uh, Pure religion and undefiled is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Surely there's the indication in the Word of God that we can be smeared on the outside. What did he mean when he says in Romans, quoting the Old Testament, that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you? Was it that the Israelites in in captivity in Babylon had been, been changed internally, that they were no longer God's people? Absolutely not. But on the outside, they were not a separated people resting and trusting in Jehovah. They were so smeared that the Gentiles couldn't see what they really were. I mean, just think back, folks, to a time in your life when people couldn't really see who you really were because of some activity you were involved in. Not that you didn't belong to God, because you did. You know, I got, I got pulled over once uh, uh, by a cop, you know, for having a muddy license plate here in Oklahoma. The cop couldn't read it, and I was like, oh, well, I didn't know that you could get a ticket for this. You know, so I got a ticket because my license plate was so muddy that the, that the policeman couldn't read it. Now, I, I didn't realize that it was inherent in, uh, in Oklahoma law that you had to wash your license plate, keep it clean. I always figured, you know, if they wanted a clean license plate, they should sell it and keep it that way. I, I wasn't going to worry about it. I didn't want the license plate to begin with. But be that as it may, I received a traffic citation because the policeman said my license plate was, was so smeared with mud that it couldn't be read. And I suddenly think, boy, that's, that's what he's saying here. Didn't change the license plate. In fact, when you washed it off, still looked pretty good. You know? Didn't change the license plate. But it couldn't be read. I believe that you can become so smeared that you can't be read. We are told in the epistles that we are God's epistle known and read of men. We just studied that in chapter 3. And here's one so smeared it can't be read. Filthiness, smearing, outside, smearing of flesh and spirit. Now we have a little problem with flesh because we've been taught to believe that whenever the word flesh occurs, it's, it's, it is that which is contrary to the spirit. You know, the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. 
uh, these are contrary one to another so that you can't do what you would and, and, and so forth. But if, if you'll simply look down in verse 5, for when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. In both verses, the word Greek word is the same. There are, there are passages of Scripture where this word is used of that which is evil. That's the old nature, the sin nature, the old man, however you want to call it. But I think it is wrong to say that every time that, that Greek word, the word is SARS in the Greek, every time it occurs in the Greek, it means, that you, it means your old nature. The word has meanings, just as our English word have meanings, which are determined by the context. The, you know, the classic example, I'm sure you know, you know, that every minister seems like uses is ball. You know, I went to a ball, I had a ball, I, you know, uh, uh, or I played ball. Now, you'd know immediately from the context what I meant, but those were totally different words. They're spelled exactly the same. They're pronounced exactly the same. The meanings are absolutely different. Now, that's a stark example, but what the Holy Spirit, I believe, is talking about here is that frame of reference in which the new creation dwells. There is an area where my walk, my earthly existence can be smeared to the extent that I can't be read as an epistle of God. There's also a way to smear the spirit uh, doctrinally, the doctrinal smearing. We talk about doctrinal error. I believe God defends his word jealously. I am intensely more concerned, folks, about doctrinal correctness than I am moral correctness. That does not mean that I'm suggesting a uh, negligent or irresponsible attitude toward morals. Not at all. But I am supremely interested in doctrinal correctness. Neither am I convinced that I have any corner on truth. I can only tell you what I believe. I can, I can only tell you that I have an intense desire to be doctrinally correct. The Spirit can also be smeared. I don't believe that doctrinal error changes the structure, the, the nature of the new creation. But I do believe that that doctrinal error smears the new creation on the outside. And so there is a smearing, a defiling, a filthiness, however you want to translate the word, as, as long as you'll agree that it doesn't mean a change of that which is real, but only that which is apparent. That can also happen doctrinally. The verse then uh, closes with uh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. First of all, uh, there has been a strong concentration within evangelical circles for many, many years that we must perfect holiness. You know, this is one of the key verses that they often use, you know, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You know, we read in John, be holy as I am holy. Uh, surely these are appeals that I ought to be like Christ. You know, we write hymns on being like Jesus. We wear bracelets that say, what would Jesus do? WWJD, or, or maybe those things are still around. I don't know. As if we just simply do what Jesus did, which I believe is law. I don't believe there is any appeal in all of the Bible to be like Jesus. Neither do I believe that you can, but I believe that you are to rest in Christ. I also believe that obedience is the primary element of fellowship from the human standpoint at least, but not to be like Christ. I'm not asked nor commanded to be like Christ. I'm commanded to obey Christ, to rest in the finished work of Christ, to recognize that I am indeed dead unto sin, but alive unto God because of Christ. Now, if you, if you want to call that trying to be like Christ, that's dearly beloved. Perfecting is a word which means complete. Completing can also be translated that way. Mature or developing, growing with an eye toward that which is complete, toward that which is finished. It doesn't mean that I am to make holiness, create holiness, or do holiness, but that I am to mature in that which is already true. 
Now the word holy, saint, sanctified, all the same word. You might just as well translate John, be sanctified as I am, be, be holy as I am, uh, as I am holy, be as a saint as I am a saint. Now I, I sort of push the words a little bit there, but it, it's the same root word. Whether we're talking holiness, sanctified, set apart, saint, all the same word. God set apart pots and pans in the Old Testament. These were set apart for God. This word holiness simply says perfecting or completing your, your set apartness to God. God set you apart. I will be your God. You shall be my people. In fact, the language says, I am your God. You are my people. This isn't something that's going to eventually happen. This is true because I chose you and I said, you are my people and I am your God. And they were constantly disobedient. Very, very seldom, if ever, in fellowship with God. But He was their God, and they were His people. God set them apart. God isn't saying that you should improve your holiness. You can't do that anyway. But that you should mature in it. That you should grow in it. The perfecting is one of attitude. Okay? Uh, the word fear... Christians read that, and well, right away, it's, yeah. it's, I'm afraid of punishment, I'm afraid of hell, I'm, a, I'm afraid of disfavor, when the word means reverence, and it means respect. It's used both ways in the Greek, and I, uh, and I believe it's used both ways in English. This is not the word for terror, in the sense that, you know, I, I, I fear him as, as, as a judge, but the word respect or reverence is, I reverence him as a father. Knowing, therefore, our respect, our reverence for the Lord, we persuade men. Not to, not to become new creations in Christ Jesus, but Corinthians who are already, who already are new creations in Christ, to be submitted to the Word of God and to be in fellowship with Him. The word is used in the sense of reverence or respect. I am going to mature and grow and, and, and complete that which is mature in the sense of com completeness, which God has already done in Christ Jesus. And this in the context of fellowship. If I look at this side of my fellowship, I, I clear off all the smears of flesh and spirit. If I look at this side of fellowship, I submit myself to the separation that God has already accomplished in Christ Jesus. It's a, it's a popular theme that we should be like Christ. You know, if you say to, to be like Christ, and by that you mean that you ought to be submissive to the will of God, then I'd have to agree. If that's what you mean by being like Christ, then I guess I would have to say yes. That's what I mean. If you say being like Christ means fulfilling the law, well, Christ fulfilled the law. You can never fulfill the law. Uh, for me to live, said Paul, is Christ, not I, but Christ, exchanging my life for His. Christ manifest. Uh, in, in many of the people that talk to me, Christ's likeness always seems to come back to the area of absolute implicit obedience to the law of God that I can't do. I'm not even called to do that. In fact, I'm called to an area of separation from the law. I am told sin shall not have dominion over me, for I am not under law, but under grace. If by uh, Christ's likeness you mean to me that I should walk and live like Christ, I do not believe the Scriptures even speak of such a thought. If by Christ's likeness you mean that I should walk yielded, uh, surrendered to God, not take the grace of God in vain, I believe the scriptures do present such a thought. Mainstream Christian thought, folks, suggests that I must do something so that I can be as holy as, as Christ. I believe that is absolutely not only contrary to that verse, but it's contrary to the whole theme of the Word of God. If you have not been made, already made, the righteousness of God in Christ, folks, then I can't read. Somebody needs to write me and say, Steve, you can't read. If Christ's likeness 
means obedience to the law, then I have stained that righteous garment God says that I have put on. Dearly beloved, listen, listen. If you really want some law to live by, you might consider the fact that we as Christians are commanded to live as who we are. Genuine Christ-likeness means yieldness and surrender to God concerning the promises that He has given us. I think the, the question on our mind here ought to be, you know, is whether the, the attitude of the mind in the one reading, it is going to be inclined toward merit or, or not merit. How are we going to approach it? folks, from an attitude of law or an attitude of grace. What I'm going to say is the Bible says that the unequal yoke is centered right in the context of the ministry of the gospel of reconciliation. Now, if that's, mar if that's marriage to you, then, of course, I haven't, I haven't said it was marriage. Neither have I said it isn't marriage. I haven't said it's business. Uh, neither have I said it isn't business. What I'm saying is that this unequal yoke is in the ministry of reconciliation. If you carry that into your business area, your business dealings, uh, and, and, and you may properly do that, you won't get any argument from me. If you carry it into your marriage, you won't get any argument from me. I think if we deal with the verse honestly, it's centered in this ministry that's been delivered unto us. I don't believe that Paul would be laboring in Corinth, yoked with one who is an unbeliever. Now, whether he mended tents, you know, with one who was an unbeliever, you know, I, I don't know. I have no idea. And I think the Holy Spirit consistently stays away from that area of personal conviction. So one video, one verse. Uh, I apologize to some of you if you thought maybe we could go a little further. I wanted to spend quite a bit of time on this first verse. I thank you all for joining us. I ask for your continued prayers for this ministry. Uh, we love you all. We truly do. Until next time, rest in Him. Thanks for watching.